I'm Chuck Colson, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce you today to one of my good friends, Dick Woodward, and to tell you about something very exciting that he is doing, a project that Dick has begun to bring the Bible to life in a way that I think few people have ever done before. Dick Woodward is the pastor of a church, but he's one of the best Bible teachers that I have encountered. And he has taken the Old Testament and the New and is putting it in a mini Bible course, which Dick is going to tell us about in just a couple of minutes. But let me say why I think it's so important. Not only is Dick a very gifted teacher and a wonderful brother in Christ, but Dick is doing something that is striking right at the heart of one of the greatest problems we face today. Here we are, supposedly a Christian nation. At least 81% of the American people say that they're Christian. And yet, in that same survey that George Gallup conducted recently, when 81% of the people said they were Christian, only 42% could name who gave the Sermon on the Mount. Some people sadly thought it was given on horseback. Only 46% of the people could name the four Gospels. And here we are in America, a country which published last year 500 million Bibles. That's two and a half Bibles for every man, woman, and child in America. And yet the Library of Congress, which did a survey asking people the most important book in their life, had responses from 1,382 people. And of the responses asking the most significant book in their life, only 15 named the Bible. Less just a little over 1%. No, we're not a Christian nation. For shame, we are a nation of biblical illiterates. And the most important challenge to those who profess to be Christian today is that we begin to take that Bible seriously, that we begin to study it. We cannot possibly love our God unless we know our God. And the great need today is for us to know the Word of God, to understand it, and to really spend that time in concentrated study. Because as we do, as I've discovered in my own Christian life over the last 10 years, as we find ourselves more in the Word of God, we find our knowledge growing and our love of God, and we begin to live obedient Christian lives as a result of it. And that's why I'm so excited about Dick, who's here today and is going to tell you a little bit about the mini Bible college that Dick is running and uh, the course that he's offering and uh, the tapes that are available and the curriculum. Dick, tell the folks who are watching us, uh, just what is the mini Bible college? Explain it. Well, Chuck, the mini Bible college is a devotional survey of the scripture, I call it, with an emphasis upon the practical application of the truth that's taught in the scripture. And our objective is to lead the so-called layperson who's never opened his Bible before through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and give him the structure within which he can gain perspective on each of the 66 books of the Bible so that he can come and, and study those books for himself. That's really essentially what it is. It's a it's taught in uh, six quarters, three Old Testament quarters and three New Testament quarters. I've actually taught this course in the communities where I've lived and pastored, and we've had at times 600 or more people enroll to take the course. And uh, this has just encouraged me more and more that there was a hunger for this, and so we pursued it. I would imagine a lot of people watching us uh, know the name Harry Dent. Harry Dent was oh, yeah. the uh, southern strategist in the White House at the time that I was Mr. Nixon's uh, chief counsel, and Harry was uh, very prominent at that time. He left, uh, he escaped Watergate. He didn't, uh, he was not one of those who went to jail, but uh, left and went back to South Carolina and opened a law practice or resumed his law practice and was very, very successful. And I can remember when Harry called me one day just a couple of years ago and he said, Chuck, I uh, am going to abandon my law practice. And President Reagan had just been elected and I thought, Harry, you're a Republican, you've got a friend in the White House. He said, no, I've got to do it. He said, I've been listening to some tapes and some teaching by a fellow by the name of Dick Woodward. He said, he has so convicted me that I've got to give my life to serving the Lord and spreading the good news and encouraging other people to teach the Bible. So you had a great impact in your teaching upon the life of Harry Dent. Harry is now in full-time Christian service. And I remember when I met Harry, I was speaking at a retreat. And I was speaking on that sermon that people think was given on horseback, that sermon on the mount. And my whole thrust was, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? And we said that Jesus really assembled those people on that mountaintop because he wanted to train people to be part of his solution, part of his answer. I never heard of Harry, but when I finished that retreat, he jumped up and put his finger in my face and he said, I'm 51 years old and, and I'm sick and tired of being part of the problem. I'm going to be part of the solution before another year passes. And, I didn't know anything about him, never met him, but he got these tapes 
And in the next year, he went through the entire Bible with audio tapes and notes that we produced. And then I found out a year later how much they had meant to him. Tell us what's different about your Bible study and why uh, it's what, the unique aspects of what you're offering in your mini Bible. Okay, for one course. thing, Chuck, we this is not a scholarly presentation, and I feel that many Bible studies that are supposed to be for lay people are a bit over their heads. They're too scholarly. I think the average lay person really doesn't understand a professor in a professional school of theology or of the Bible. And so we try not to use any Protestant Latin, you know, a lot of the theological <laughs> terms. We try to keep it very simple. And we try to come to each book or portion of the scripture asking questions like, what does it say, what does it mean, and what does it mean to you? Uh, they call that observation, interpretation, application. And we don't get into a lot of the arguments, you know, about the literary form in which these books are presented, which is where a lot of people bog down. No matter what conviction they have about the literary form, they don't seem to get beyond that. And look for the truth that's in these books. Now, uh, Jesus said in, in his high priestly prayer there in John 17, Thy word is truth. And he said in context that the word of God is the truth that can set the lay person apart to his shepherd while he's in this world like uh, a sheep in the midst of a pack of wolves. That was really the context in which he said that. Well, that burst upon me like a sunrise or something. The word is truth. And so we began pursuing the word in terms of what is the truth that's taught by this book or this chapter. And that's what we try to share with the lay person. And, and we try to structure the course in such a way that we lead them uh, to the scriptures so they can spend the rest of their lives getting it for themselves. It's really just an introduction to the scripture. Yeah, I think if I might interject there, Dick, one of the things I found most helpful, I've listened, I've been part of most of the the Bible study courses that are making the rounds today and uh, yours I think probably in part because of your gifts as a teacher and a communicator. You communicate brilliantly, beautifully. But also I think the way in which you structured your material, I found myself absolutely absorbed, gripped uh, in, in the lessons that you've taught during our staff conferences and the tapes I have seen and listened to. And one of the interesting things, and I'm not quite sure how you do this, but one of the interesting things is that fairly sophisticated Christians in our, let's say, our staff in prison fellowship yes. who have studied with you and you've taught us. Uh, some of the more mature, more sophisticated Christians came away with so much from it. And then some of the younger and less mature came away with so much from it that you have a way, I think, of putting the universal truth of the scripture in a way that everyone can understand. And I maybe would take a minute right now to do sure, this, but sure. mm -hmm. I know going through your the Old Testament survey. This is kind of a, an imposing book here, but it, it really uh, it isn't once you start going through it, a book at a time. And you, just so the folks watching understand, you have tapes, both video and audio, That's right. that go with each of these uh, books of the Bible. So that here you have, I just don't put it arbitrarily, the First and Second Chronicles. And you've got an assignment, and you explain the period of history you're covering, and then you you take and paragraph by paragraph you take the people through what is being covered. Yes, we try to give them the uh, maybe the background, the historical perspective they ought to have on the books of the Bible, background introductory information, then we try to give them some idea of how the books are organized and we outline the book. And our whole objective is to show them how to approach that book of the Bible. You know, when Jesus said, feed my sheep, what he really was instructing us to do and exhorting us to do was leave the sheep to the pasture and let them eat for themselves. So often I think we uh, we feed the sheep like, you know, baby food is pre-digested food. You know, the minister digests it and then he baby feeds the people. But our objective is to lead them to the pasture and let them eat for themselves. So we're trying to give them perspective on each book of the Bible so that they can come and study that book and, and gain uh, a lot from it for the rest of their lives. Now, uh, Dick, in the course of this, just explain your tapes there. For example, yes, well, this would be from one, one book. Yes, we didn't bring uh, everything. Now, actually, that notebook you have is three quarters of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is right. taught in three quarters. And this little tape album is one quarter of, of, of the three quarters. tapes. Yeah, there are 30-minute lectures, and there are 30 lectures for each quarter. And there are three of those 30-minute lectures on each of these audio tapes. So if a person had these audio tapes and that notebook and their Bible, they could just with these audio tapes and notes be led right through the scripture from Genesis to Revelation 
uh, looking for the devotional truth and its application to their own lives. As well as the historical overview. Oh, yes. I think one of the things that people have the, the hardest time with, when they go to church, they'll hear a sermon, mm -hmm. and the pastor will preach from Ezekiel this week, and then That's right. something will come up, and he'll be preaching uh, from the story of Joseph in Genesis. And, yes. And you never get the whole sweep of the Bible. I think one of the things that you've done that, that excites me the most is that you've gone right in the beginning and taken it right through. You've got the whole overview, the survey, so that you get both the history and you understand yeah. God's relationship with man from the beginning to now and yes. to what will be in Revelation. Yes. But you also plumb out of that, uh, pull out of that, the real devotional truths out of each of those books yes. uh -huh. so that you're getting both the historical overview and the well, spiritual frankly, message. Chuck, I believe we underestimate the so-called layperson. So do I. Uh, the lay person has a whole lot more education now than he used to, and I think the church developed a mentality that all we can do in terms of the lay person is preach or teach application, which means sermons. We can preach bits and pieces of the Bible in sermons, but I think we've underestimated the ability of a lay person to grasp the whole counsel of God and all the Word of God. Uh, I came to this conclusion years ago. I, my father only had a third grade education. And he had a hunger to study the scripture, but nobody would take him seriously when he asked ministers to teach him the Bible. But when I went to college and began studying for the ministry, I had a course, a survey of the Bible, taught by Dr. J. Vernon McGee at Biola University in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that two-year course where he took us through the whole Bible with the emphasis upon the devotional application of the content of the English Bible. It really ministered to me like nothing had at that point in my Christian life. I was a very young Christian. But when I came home for vacations, my father would want to know everything I'd learned from Dr. McGee since I'd, you know, been home. And I began teaching my father the survey Dr. McGee taught me. And when I saw what that meant to my father, I developed the conviction that that's what the man in the pew ought to hear. That's what he wants to hear. That's what he hungers to hear. We began in our churches as a pastor setting up these mini Bible colleges. And we had many lay people enroll. And when I saw what happened to those people, what it meant to them, it just kept confirming this conviction that this is what the lay people want to hear and, and need to hear. Well, I've seen it myself, of course, in your teaching, Dick, with our staff. So you have a way, I think, of communicating, Dick, that really uh, impresses those basic, very fundamental truths uh, and communicates them to the lay people in a way that people can understand them and, and well, retain them. Because I was um, so thick when I came to the Lord. <laughs> no, I don't and, think that's true. And as a student, I needed someone to make it simple for me. And uh, I think most people need it to be made simple for them. Well, I think maybe if, if I had to distinguish one thing apart from your beautiful spirit and uh, the way in which you communicate and the gifts that you have, I think apart, if I had to, to single up one thing, it would be that you are able to take the, the deepest kinds of truths and convey them in ways that people can understand. I think the Bible is something you never stop studying. I know when I first became a Christian, I opened it up and I, first thing I want to do, my lawyer's mind demanded evidence, you know, what is this book? And sure. I started reading all about what I always thought all my life were fables and legends and folklore. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then I started to read it and it began to affect me, the things I would read. And of course, the Bible depends for its historical evidence, if you will, we're Christians. And, the fact that Jesus said, thy word is truth, as you yeah. said earlier. Yeah. And uh, throughout, he speaks about the authority of the scripture and, and treats the uh, scripture with reverence and with authority over his life and as the revelation of God. And I, and I think that's why this, the Bible is so important. And I know, because you and I have discussed it so many times, yeah. that you believe the Bible is the revelation of God and oh, it's absolutely. inspired and absolutely. has authority over our lives. And you know, we've developed a view of inspiration, Chuck, in teaching the Bible to lay people. As a social worker, I think I made this discovery. You know, the Bible's all about life. Uh, you know, Moses said it, you know, that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So the purpose of the word is to show man how to live. And my experience was, the more you know about the word, the more you understand life, and if you go out there where life's going on, the more you know about life, the more you know about the Word, because the two throw light back upon one another. I think as a social worker, my view of inspiration grew. I had the view of inspiration that many evangelicals have. The Bible is true because it's inspired. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. I accept it. And so anything the Bible says, I believe it's true, whether I've proven it in experience or not. But I think as a social worker, and then as a pastor, in life situations, 
I've come to a fuller view of inspiration, which includes the first one, but which would say the Bible is inspired because the Bible is true. When you discover that truth that Jesus said the word is, and also Jesus said in John 7, 17, that if we would come to the word with the will to do the will of God. In other words, we come to the word looking for truth to show us how to live, that we're going to relate to our life with the commitment that when we see what the truth is, we will relate it to our life. Now, when we do that, that truth has such an impact upon our life. I really appreciate, uh, Dick, the way you've put that, because it is so important. You know, there's, a, there's an air of anti-intellectualism that grows up in the Christian faith where we want to say, we believe because we believe, and don't anyone challenge me with any kind of facts or evidence or science or reason. Yeah. And I think that's tragic, because the more I have studied the evidence uh, surrounding the historicity of the resurrection and of the Bible, the more it confirms its truth. And the way you put it is so beautiful. It's propositional truth, of course, but then we begin to see the truth, and the truth supports the fact that it is the Word of God. And, and that's really so. That's historically so. Well, you know, the thing that frustrates me, Chuck, as I observe the battle for the Bible, which I've been observing for 33 years now, uh, people miss the point, I think, when they come to a book like Jonah, and they argue over, really, the literary form of the book that's and the historicity of the book without ever getting to the message of the book. Yeah. To me, the message is prejudice and how this man overcame his prejudice. He hated right. Ninevites and God worked him through that right. and showed him God loves everybody, even Ninevites. Nobody ever gets to that because right. they get bogged down in this battle over literary form. So we need to start with the truth and then come back to literary form, I think. Yeah, and I think if you if you do interpret the Bible from its in, in its proper literary context, yeah. uh, its truth becomes evident to you and you don't get hung up in the, in the kind of arguments That's we're talking right. about. I mean, I believe the Bible to be the Holy Word of God. I believe it to be God's revelation. I believe we have to live under its authority. That's why your course is so crucial, because what it does is to enable the layman, rather uniquely, I must say, at least in my experience, this course, probably more than any other Bible study I have seen, enables the layman to be able to take the Bible, see it all in context, get the historical overview, have the basic truth of each book communicated by someone who has a great gift of communication. And when you're all through this course, and it's, a, and it's an extensive course, and this is for people who are serious, which every Christian ought to be, yeah. what you get is the truth of the scripture historically and in terms of the spiritual message God is giving. Yeah. And then if you understand and it's taught by someone like yourself who, who understands the authority and the revelation of the Bible and whose, whose view of that is solid as yours is, that's the kind of grounding that our churches and our lay people so desperately need. You know, my experience has been, we, we have a lot of breakfast for men, Bible study breakfast. And very often, this will be a typical uh, interaction with a, an intellectual type of man. Say you're beginning the book of Job, and they want to talk about the literary form. You know, what is this business of God and Satan having this talk about Job? And my approach has always been, well, let's put that issue aside just for a few minutes, and let's think about the truth of the book of Job. And then we'll come back to that. But once you get into the truth of the book, they have no need to come back to that. <laughs> it doesn't matter once they've been really grasped by that truth. Oh, you can, you, and you bring them back to that in a nice way in the lectures I've seen, the way you do it, too. Uh, Dick, let me ask you this, which, I, which particularly fascinates me, because in my own life I've seen how God has worked through adversity. I heard someone say once that only a fool fails to learn from adversity. Yeah. But uh, I look back on my life, and I realize the most important thing about my life is I went to prison. It was not the scholarships I won or the decisions I made when I was yeah. the right hand of the President of the United States or when I was the United States Senate or any of the things that I did a uh, case I argued in the Supreme Court and won every lawyer's dream. Uh, uh, it was none of those things that really counted ultimately in my life. What counted in my life, what God uses today, is my one defeat. And if that's so, then what counts is obedience, far more than success. And uh, we put our emphasis, I think, all too often in the Christian life on the worldly value of success when really what God wants is a faithful heart, an obedient person, and he'll often work through our defeats, our adversities, and our setbacks. I think so, the Apostle Paul wrote letters to the new church because he couldn't get to visit them because he was in prison. Right. And he probably maybe was frustrated doing that. But, of course, the letters became part of God's revelation. Oh, uh, sure. And, and the, tell, us how you're, tell us how this course came to be, that you've been teaching so many years, so successfully, came to be put into these tapes, the video, the audio tapes, and the and this marvelous syllabus. Uh, tell us how that came Well, out. frankly, we were teaching it, as we said, in our churches to groups of people. And uh, frankly, I was at a seminar, or it was a retreat, that Prison Fellowship had. And one of your people, uh, Alan Chambers, asked me if I would go into prisons and, and teach the Bible. And frankly, I, I have MS, and so I don't have the stamina to do that. So some of my brothers that are 
beautiful brothers, decided that if we could put this mini Bible college course on videotape, audio tape, and package it this way, that could go into the prisons and it wouldn't take a bit of energy out of me. So that was the original motivation for putting this thing together. And since we've been putting it together, of course, we've found all kinds of uses. Churches are using it for Sunday school. People are using it for home Bible studies. Uh, it's just been used in ways that we didn't even anticipate. Tell me something. Uh, to, uh, just as a, you're pastoring a church and you're teaching the Bible constantly and you're busy, and how did you how did you get a group together that would support you in this? Or how how are you being financed? People well, always want to know today yeah. the, the, about the money being spent. Of course, in the Christian I think world. that's a very good question. Uh, these uh, five men that I mentioned uh, don't even go to my church, but I mentioned I have these men's breakfasts and mm -hmm. I speak at retreats a lot, and I develop friendships with these men, and uh, they just got together and decided they had taken my mini Bible college. Eighty percent of the people that take this course don't go to my church. They're from mainline churches, and these men were in that category, but this meant so much to them that they just wanted to get this word out before more people. And so it's very expensive to put this together. Mm -hmm. The videotaping and editing and so forth, uh, they're probably spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars putting this together. Uh, these men don't want their investment back. They don't want to make any money. In fact, the understanding uh, among the six of us is that if it ever did reach the point, it hasn't yet, but if it ever reached the point where it was marketing and and, and bringing in a difference between what it costs to produce it and, and what comes in from these tuitions and so forth, that that money would go to support missions like prison fellowship or other missionary work. That uh, it's, an, it's a covenant with the six of us that nobody, including myself, will ever make any money from this course. So I just That's love their, their, their commitment uh, to the Lord first and then to me. Uh, and their, real, their vision is to get the word out. I wish we had a few more people like that who cared enough about getting the the word and the Bible taught to the church today that they would do the kind of thing that you're doing and that men are doing, but your life is a testimony too, to me, Dick, and an inspiration to many people because uh, with the physical disability you have, uh, you couldn't travel around as much as others, and so you didn't let that adversity defeat you, but instead uh, God has used that so that you can use this medium of television yes. and tapes to communicate your message, which will probably be seen by thousands of uh, more people than would have ever seen it if you've been able to travel. Well, to me, it's a classic application of another scripture. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul told about his thorn in the flesh, right. and he said that he asked God three times to take it away, and this man had seen people raised from the dead and, and healed right. of sicknesses. But God's answer was no. Uh, in the Living Bible, he says, my strength looks good on weak people. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm going to just keep you weak. And when Paul understood that, he didn't just accept it. He said, I glory in it. I rejoice in it. I, you know, in my weakness, I'm made strong. That's right. And, and the Living Bible says, uh, the less I have, the more I depend on him. Well, frankly, I had the vision for this as a college student 32 years ago. And as a pastor for years before I became ill, I don't think I ever would have done this well. It was only when I became ill that I think I finally became obedient and, and put together what God had been laying it on my heart to do for many, many years. It's amazing what God has to do to get ourselves out of the way, isn't it? But isn't that's really what it boils down to. God has, we have to get out of the way so uh, before God can really do his work. And I, that's so great. I look back on the first 40 years of my life and realize how much I drove myself and was so success oriented and so many achievements. Yeah. Never amounted to anything. It wasn't until I was broken those things were gone that I really discovered the meaning of life. And so true for so many people. You know, the most exciting thing to me, Chuck, about all of this is uh, just without intending uh, to produce the results that are coming, the exciting thing to me is, you know, uh, Paul said, uh, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And our objective, really, and the results we've seen so far in getting the layman into the Word of God and the Word of God into the layman who's never opened his Bible before is that. Like Peter said, the Word is the incorruptible seed that generates the new birth. So, you know, uh, our prayer has been, not that we'll make Bible experts out of people, the most unhappy people in the world can be Bible experts, you know, <laughs> that don't have any reality. But our prayer as people get into this course is that they will come into faith because Paul said it will come through coming into the Word. He said hearing the Word because people were illiterate largely then, and they heard the Word. They didn't read it like we do. So we might say, Faith comes by reading the Word of God mm -hmm. with the right approach. And then we have seen many people converted without ever bringing it to a verdict, without ever giving an imitation. As people do these assignments and they actually go through the scripture, 
they become converted. And that's the most exciting result we've seen so far about this. So our prayer is that as people come to the Word, and they get into the Word and the Word gets into them, that they'll come into faith and that they'll be born again. That's really what so excites me about this about this teaching, because you're not only getting the historical overview, you're not only getting a brilliant communicator to convey the truths, but you're getting the spiritual truth out of each one of the books of the Bible. If anybody goes through this course, uh, they're going to have to be changed. You're going to be changed, and you're going to understand the Word of God, and it's going to be engraved in your heart and your consciousness in a way that it has not been before, and you're going to want more. Uh, you're going to want to know it more, and there's no end. That's one of the beautiful things about the Bible. I've read all, I suppose, I love to read, and I love history, and I read literature, and uh, you can always finish all the works of Dostoevsky, and that's the end of it, but you can never finish the Bible. Every time you read it, it unearths a new truth. And uh, I don't know any course that I've taken or any study, anyone I've studied with who has brought the reality of the spiritual message and the depths of riches of that spiritual message to life so much as Dick has. So, Dick, I just pray that God will use this mightily and that uh, maybe the folks who are watching us today will be challenged to get into the Bible uh, with your course or with any course. And uh, hopefully we'll try this out. You've seen some marvelous results with it, I know. And, yes, we have. And uh, we, We've structured these assignments, Chuck, in such a way that people could spend 60 hours a week on them. And most church people, frankly, don't have that level of commitment. But my thought is those people in prison who have time, and when they are believers, they're strong believers, mm -hmm. like you said, they have the degree of commitment that they could get a tremendous education in the Scripture oh, my, if yes. they did all these assignments. And if they had the hunger... My experience has been that we give these assignments out, and the people who do quality homework are usually people who've been through the ringers of life. That's They've right. suffered in some way. So that seems to be the thing that brings us... Uh, and they really appreciate it. They do. Tell me one other thing, Dick, before we quit. Uh, people can take this course themselves. In other words, they can sit yes. with a tape player or a video cassette player, and they can take it and follow the syllabus, or they can do it in groups. I notice you have some marvelous questions at the end of each one of the... Your, in your syllabus each, at the end of each book of the Bible. It's a very good question. That's for group discussion. Yes, but you could also be. could test yourself on that. Could you, you could do it alone. You could do it in a group. Do it with one other person. In prisons, I think a prison chaplain could possibly proctor sure. the, the homework of the people. Or one of the volunteers. The Somebody could. Sure, the volunteers yes. who go into the prison and lead the Bible. So system. it's very flexible as to how it could be used. Well, we'll hope and pray that, uh, that God continues because he's already begun a wonderful work Dick, through your life, but we'll hope and pray that he will continue to use mightily this course uh, to challenge his people. Uh, all of you who are watching, who profess to, to be followers of Christ, will be challenged through this course and through this teaching to really take the Word of God into your heart and into your life and to let it transform you, that we really might be all that God has called us to be. We might be the invisible kingdom of God made visible on this earth. We really might make a difference with our Christian faith in the sick and dying world.